for people following online. I'd like to call up uh, the participants uh, to the discussion, uh, and starting with uh, Ms. Shirin Ebadi. J'invite aussi Tari Rahmani. Tari Rahmani, who is Narjis's husband. Et puis Monsieur Staberok. And Mr. Staberok. Bien, merci à tous d'être avec nous. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming. Yes, you can put on your headsets to listen to the interpretation. Uh, there will be two of the uh, participants uh, speaking uh, in Persian, and I think uh, Mr. Stavrok will be speaking French. That's right. Est-ce que ça fonctionne? Can you hear the interpreters okay? This is the English channel by, by the way if you're listening in English. Le numéro pour le personne c'est lequel? Channel 3 for Persian. Channel 2 for English, channel 1 for French. This is uh, channel two, the English channel. <laughs> channel one is French, channel three is uh, Persian. Pas un... Well, uh, it's not a lot of fun, this film, and uh, we're living through quite somber times uh, as well. Of course, it's a pleasure and an honor to um, moderate this discussion, but the context is a very difficult one. This war that's uh, being waged and uh, the situation regarding the torture that we've just seen. Mr. Shirinabadi, my question was the following. In the film, we learn a great deal and we learn about the extent of the suffering uh, of uh, these people who've uh, been through uh, white torture. But in Iran, you uh, also saw this uh, under the Shah and people who do protest uh, or who oppose the official discourse know that this uh, is likely to happen to them. So, do you expect this suffering and uh, how do you find the courage to become Shirin Ebadi or um, to become Najiz Mohammadi and risk that suffering? Well, thank you very much. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I must say that um, before 1979, there was a monarchy in Iran. And there were uh, a lot of political prisoners at that time. But uh, the type of torture that we saw uh, in those days was nothing compared to the torture under the Islamic Republic of Iran. And now the situation is a lot worse than uh, the situation before the revolution. So now we see white torture and solitary confinement uh, being used, as you saw in the film. And just to say one thing about that and about what's happening in Iran, Mr. Ramani, next to me, who is uh, Nagas's husband, yani 
back uh, in the 1980s, 40 years ago, was uh, locked up in a solitary confinement cell. I myself, 20 years ago, I was in prison and I was also in solitary confinement. Nages is currently in solitary confinement. So what does this tell you? Well, it tells you that uh, solitary confinement is systemic, uh, systematic torture that's being used in Iran, and it continues to this day. Of course, uh, torture goes further than solitary confinement in Iran. It's a very painful, um, distressing film. But this is just one part uh, of uh, a much larger jigsaw puzzle. And what goes on in uh, solitary confinement is, of course, very distressing. People suffer types of torture that force them into making confessions about things that they've never done. Uh, but there is also physical torture. Uh, and uh, solitary confinement is uh, one way uh, of um, starting a process of torture. And uh, I think Najez has opened a door, opened a window onto that form of torture for you um, to allow you to understand uh, a little bit about how uh, someone feels uh, when they are put in that situation. And you saw in the film that uh, those people who'd been imprisoned 40 years ago, Mr. Amoy, for example, um, who spent almost 40 years in prison, was in prison in the 1980s, uh, still hasn't forgotten how he felt when he first went into that uh, uh, solitary confinement. Solitary confinement isn't like uh, receiving 80 lashes or being beaten, uh, which leaves her physical marks and scars. But it destroys your soul. And for years, um, it's never forgotten. Someone as brave as Narges, in spite of all the risks she faced, um, managed to make this film. And she did that because she is so committed to defending human rights. She's so committed to this cause of um, showing you uh, just a little piece of that uh, distressing world in which these prisoners live. Even just in a few years, you go into prison, a young person, and you come out uh, a very elderly uh, person. And uh, she does this because she is very committed to um, defending human rights. Um, as soon as she was freed from prison, she got back to work and she started uh, to make uh, this film. And partly because of the fact that she made this film, she's been put in prison again. And I hope, with all of your support, if you speak out or protest against this uh, unjust imprisonment, she'll be uh, freed or released as, as quickly as possible. Thank you. Monsieur Rahmani, le... Mr. Rahmani, well, Shirin Ebadi didn't really reply to my question. How do you explain uh, the courage that your wife has had, given the fact that she knows uh, the risk she faces? Um, and uh, not many people have lived her through the distress of uh, solitary confinement and would take the risk to go back there. How do you explain that she's ready to do that today in Iran and she still has this desire to resist? Uh, 
ببینید یه زربور مسئله ایرانی هست میگه تا ظلم ها An Iranian proverb says that for all, as long as there is justice uh, a struggle continues and um, you know that is a um, permanent um, principle those who fight for freedom must do so um, with uh, this very high price that they have to pay um, to try to achieve justice and uh, you know Nagez uh, believes very strongly in human rights. I was uh, a militant myself, I was an activist, I was in prison for 15 years and uh, I spent uh, a year and a half in solitary confinement. But for me, solitary confinement is part of my struggle. But when they arrested Nagez, and she was put into solitary confinement, which is usually where they put men. For me, it's like a tomb where you have uh, an opening in front of you rather than above your head. But a tomb nonetheless. And Nagas explained that uh, solitary confinement is a form of torture. Um, it's not a regular occurrence when you're involved in a political struggle. But if you want to fight for freedom, you must be brave. And you also need to identify um, methods for your struggle um, so that it's not so difficult for the majority and so that your struggle can ultimately be successful. In my view, uh, the divine or divine law is similar to human rights law because there is a fundamental principle. If you see this film, you'll see that there are men and women, um, Mujahideen, members of the Ba'i community, and people who belong to all kinds of groups and communities. And for Nagez, one of the main accusations was the fact, or one of the main charges was the fact that she'd made this film and published a book about the film. Mr. Stabirok, you, you, you. thank you, Mr. Stabirok. You know about uh, these methods of torture because you uh, are very much involved in fighting uh, this. How do you uh, put uh, uh, white torture in the context of torture as a whole, and how do you see this film? Firstly, I'd like to thank your wife for this uh, film and for um, bringing this subject to our attention. Uh, uh, all of these issues connected with torture, which are very important. It's a very touching film, even for someone who works uh, on uh, issues connected with torture. It's such an important film because if you're at the UN and there's a discussion about the prevention of torture, this reminds me of uh, Patricia Cass, who had that song about uh, my guy talks about love like a car. It's something abstract. But torture is not abstract. It's tangible, it's individual, and it affects people's lives. If you conducted a survey outside of this room, you might have, you might find that most people see uh, torture as being brutal force. Like uh, in Spain, you had the, the Inquisition or something. But you know, most uh, torture survivors will tell you that the psychological impact is much worse. Uh, and I think solitary confinement, psychological torture, uh, some people see this as a kind of uh, lighter form of torture, but actually it robs people of their personality, of their humanity, and this has been done for so long now. I think what's very important is that uh, a total uh, prohibition of torture in, is needed. Uh, it's different to other human rights abuses. Uh, you talked about people being tortured under the Shah, but, you know, um, people can still uh, try to help these survivors, but they will never forget the experience they've been through. And one last thing, torture is always... Uh, 
me against the others, or one person against another, and it's dehumanizing. Political torture is uh, an attempt to destroy uh, opponents, uh, destroy human rights uh, defenders or political activists. And torture is always pitting people, one person against another. And what I'm always struck by when I fight torture is that people do their utmost to build these uh, systems of torture as we did in the, as we saw in the film. Um, Madame Mbadi, le, le, les derniers mots. Uh, de Thank you. That last comment was uh, that it's taken a lot of effort to build this system of torture. Maybe there's training for the interrogators or for the prison guards. Um, how do you see that? And all of these efforts that the Islamic Republic of Iran has made to try to break the resistance of the prisoners. Is this a raw state program to, to, to train interrogators in this way? I'm 100% sure that there is a systemic training program for torturers for torture and to learn how to kill people, actually. You probably know that the Iranian regime has committed um, quite a lot of uh, murders and assassinations. When our vow diplomats who was posted in Belgium is actually currently in prison because he took part in an assassination attempt. The number of murders, assassinations within Iran and abroad is quite high. Who are the murderers? Who is behind those assassinations? Some intelligence people have had special training to execute uh, these assassinations, and uh, there is training for torture as well as for assassinations. When they enroll an intelligence agent, they train them. And of course, the regime is fully aware of what is happening in prisons. All of this is planned, carefully planned, to and with uh, to put an end to the um, rebellion. But on the other hand, the more people undergo this suffering and are oppressed, the more resistant they become. If it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. That is precisely what is happening nowadays in Iran. The people is getting stronger. Maybe 40 years ago, people weren't brave enough and weren't ready to go outside in the street and show any opposition, but they now are. And I'm sure the people we overcome one day and bring democracy to Iran. Let me put a second question to you. You were detained yourself and in 2009 when Ahmadinejad was again re-elected. Uh, your husband was detained as well and spent some time in prison. He ended up um, making a confession on TV and he even criticized you. How do you explain uh, that uh, a confession um, like that can happen? And how was it for you um, seeing your husband uh, 
criticizing How do people end up making a confession? Well, it's very simple because they are tortured. They are so badly treated, so terribly tortured that people end up um, being ready to confess anything. The confession is then filmed and shown. And this happened to my husband, but to many other people. There were lots of confessions shown on TV. People confessed crimes of their own and confessed crimes attributed to other people. Once they got out of Iran, they were able to tell exactly what had happened to them. As I was saying, torture is systematic and it has unfortunately always existed. As for certain people that are maybe more vulnerable, they will end up speaking and confessing for those who resist, some of them resist till the end and refuse to confess anything. This is precisely why some of our, of our fellow resistants were killed in prison because they resisted till the end. And this goes to show how far the regime is determined to go to repress any resistance. They're not afraid of killing anyone. Monsieur Rahmani, uh, uh, il y a cette torture blanche, il y a ces salles d'isolement. So, how many um, con solitary confinement cells are there in uh, the uh, prison you were in? There are not only uh, solitary confinement cells in Evin prison, there are also in other places, in other detention centers, and the intelligence ministry also has this kind of cell. We've got hidden detention centers as well. And Eshwatobon, Ajam Shinge are names you probably haven't heard of. There are several security and detention centers. It's just that Evin is the most well-known. Ward number 209 belongs to the intelligence services, and in each corridor there are 10 cells. In another place there are maybe 50 or 60 solitary confinement cells. What is completely unimaginable in Switzerland or in any other European country. In Chile, they filled a full stadium of, uh, with people and then people were placed in solitary confinement cells. In uh, the 1980s in the north of Rwanda, because they didn't have in, enough prisons, they were putting prisoners in small buses, blindfolded for one whole night. I don't know whether you've seen the film entitled 12 Years and One Night that takes place in Uruguay. Some prisoners had actually spent six months being blindfolded in a corridor. They had to remain 
شیش ماه انفرادی بود جلوی سلول من یعنی اساسا We had a colleague in Iran who spent uh, some time in similar condition in similar conditions knowing the exact number of solitary confinement cells doesn't give you a full picture of the situation if they need to they will come up with new facilities and solitary confinement is a very effective tool now this film is very important we've got people who resist however there are long lasting effects I don't know whether you've seen that film I was talking earlier about on Uruguay one person in the film actually became the Uruguayan president later on and you can see in that film as well how long lasting the effects of solitary confinement are I think we need a massive reaction for things to change. If Nargis is precisely talking about that, it's because she wants more people to know she wants thousands of women to fight openly and demonstrate in the streets. In solitary confinement states, they will force you to any confession. You will confess to being a spy, to being a criminal. If you spend some time in there, you'll confess to anything, and this has to stop. Monsieur Armani, when on est dans la cellule d'isolement, qu'est-ce que on entend? When you're in the cell, what do you hear from the outside world? Is there anything, any noise? That's a good question. Well, it depends. Narges was telling me that um, once I was in a, a cell and I had 24 hours a day a yellow light in my eyes. In the 1980s, when I was myself in prison, I was in a 1.6 by 1.8 meter cell, which meant that I just could do three or four steps. I could hear voices. I could hear the noises of the torture being um, done on other prisoners but there was no noise at night. Later on, they built bigger cells, which were more silent. And normally, you'd have a light bulb shining 24 hours a day, straight in your eyes, and a fan rotating nonstop. And this is another type of torture. I tried thinking about famous Iranian songs and I could imagine the fan playing that song. You have to sleep even with if the light is on non-stop and it makes you completely lose um, the notion of the time you don't know whether it's day or night all of your worst and most terrible memories come up to mind this is torture as well and your interrogators are especially trained they adjust their knowledge and their techniques. In the 1980s, there were lots of political prisoners. They were getting lashes. In the 1980s, it was more women, teachers. Activists of all sorts. And Nargis 
she was a spokesperson for these people. She was an advocate for them. So you see they are able to adjust the type of torture according to the times and the needs. Yes, one thing I'd like to add on the solitary confinement cells. Mr. Ramani described the cell to you. You must know also that there is no bed, no chair, just a dirty floor and maybe a blanket. They won't give you anything, no pillows, no nothing. You have to sleep on the cold floor, and that's really hard. If you haven't lived through that, you cannot imagine how hard it is. Not being able to rest your head, you have absolutely nothing. They take your watch, they'll take your glasses. It's cold, maybe they'll give you a blanket but a very light one. You have to choose whether you cover yourself with a blanket or you roll it up and put it under your head, but then you'll be feeling extremely cold. After having spent one week in uh, this cell, I started uh, getting terrible back pain. That's when I understood why. My clients, when they come out of prison, have such problem with their, with their back, so, such terrible back pain. But just you try once sleeping that, that and you'll understand. It may seem so minimal. But it's one of the many things that happen to people in solitary confinement when they leave these quarters and go back to the normal, normal ward, at least they've got a pillow, but they have got nothing there. Merci beaucoup. Um, Monsieur Stavrok, vous, vous, uh, Mr. Stavrok, you've been listening to all of that. And it's true that uh, in Iran, there are a lot of differences between men and women, where they can go, uh, but it seems that for torture, there are no differences. Uh, torture is committed on women and men. How do you explain that? Is solitary confinement used more for women than it is for men? Uh, is uh, physical torture more used uh, on men? Well, um, it's difficult for me to reply to that. Uh, obviously, in the film, we saw that they were men and women. Um, but um, it doesn't seem uh, as though there is much uh, difference uh, between men and women in terms of the way in which uh, human rights defenders are tortured or treated. Um, uh, but there may be other elements that we didn't see in that film. And I think uh, another aspect of solitary confinement is that, well, we do see it elsewhere. But in terms of its intensity, its duration, and the way it's used in Iran, it's um, really uh, quite exceptional. And I think there's a real combination of things uh, that's used. Uh, there is also violence. There is also um, beatings, interrogations. There's an intimidating atmosphere in the prison. So there are a whole series of factors that makes this such a distressing situation. And that's important to bear in mind as well, because uh, uh, solitary confinement is used in many countries, not perhaps to the same extent, uh, also systematically, uh, as it is in Iran. But it's just one a part of a, a range of torture techniques that you also see in other countries. I'll come back to Mr. Ramani in a moment, but um, Mr. Tabrak, as, an, as a, the head of an organization fighting torture, is it more difficult to fight this type of torture because it doesn't leave any um, physical scars? 
or is it like any other form of torture for you? Well, it, it, it leaves psychological uh, scars. And uh, actually, uh, international um, knowledge about this has uh, Im improved. So there are ways of identifying the trauma that people have suffered. And you see this in uh, law now as being, being recognized as a, a part of proof that torture has been committed. You can fight this type of torture if you have films like this one. If you just talk abstractly about confinement, you might think it's not too bad. Uh, but you'll recall that in the United States there were the famous techniques about stress and arrest, which is a, a, euphemism, a euphemism, of course. What does that mean? Well, it's torture. It's another way of torture. It's, uh, but there were also uh, techniques of uh, isolation uh, and physical and mental and psychological aspects as well. So I think you need to understand torture in its immediate and long-term effects. And talking about torture in this type of debate, uh, I think it's important to address uh, these types of torture as well, because it really does get across what it's about. Mr. Ramani. I want to say that in the Islamic Republic of Iran, women's rights are strangely, paradoxically, respected in that they are entitled to torture. Um, but uh, there is also sexual harassment of women. Back in the 1980s, we were mainly uh, left-wing thinkers fighting imperialism. And today, when you are forced to confess, you're also forced to fess, confess that you are a sexual deviant. Um, you have to confess sexual crimes. Um, and before, they never asked women or girls to do that. Um, but now, there was a woman next to Nages that we saw that film. The, in, the interrogator forced her to explain how she experienced an orgasm. And that is a form of harassment that they use particularly on women. And given the social context in Iran, this puts tremendous pressure on a woman. Um, it's uh, very distressing. And since 2010, we've seen the struggle for civil rights. Um, solitary confinement has been used uh, even more. Mr. Paddy, you can see that this is a very sophisticated form of torture, um, an almost scientific use of uh, methods to break somebody's resistance. How is it that people in Iran are such specialists in this uh, type of, uh, of torture? Unfortunately, uh, what you say is true. They are progressing in terms of their scientific knowledge of uh, this uh, form of torture daily. Um, to say that they were specialists um, would be exaggerating a little bit, but they've uh, certainly become expert um, in uh, these methods and expert torturers. Uh, I wanted to, to talk to you about a different type of torture. In the midst of winter, prisoners are forced to go outside into the cold, and they were told, and they are told that they have to inspect the cells, and so that the prisoners have to stay outside for three hours in the cold. You know, that's not a form of beating or a form of flogging. Uh, you just 
force the prisoner to spend three or four hours in the, in the, in the snow and um, they can then claim that they haven't uh, done anything. This is a form of torture. In certain prisons, including in the prison where Nargis is being held at the moment, in fact, I spoke to her and she said there was no drinking water. They don't have access to drinking water. Um, prisoners have to buy their own water. So it's actually very expensive to be a prisoner. When you consider everything you have to buy, they just give you potatoes, bread, and that's it. And if you spend eight uh, years in prison, then of course you need to also eat uh, vegetables, you need to eat other things. And a prisoner is told, well, there's a shop downstairs, if you like, if you've got any money, then we can take you and you can buy uh, something else to eat. There are a limited number of uh, fruits and vegetables that are sold at twice the usual price within the prison. And a, prison, a prisoner even has to buy their own drinking water, as I said earlier. In the Bacek prison, which is where Nargis is being hold, held at the moment, she has to buy uh, an apple which costs twice as much as it does outside prison. And for prisoners who don't have money, do you know what they do? Well, you know, thankfully, um, political prisoners show great solidarity to one another. So, very often, um, a prisoner who does have a little bit of money um, will help those who don't um, buy some apples or something a little bit more to eat. Um, since Nags has been in Bacek, she hasn't had a cup of tea. Because the tea they serve is made of dirty water. And uh, there is dirt floating on the tea. Um, and so you just cannot drink it. So that is another form of torture. How can you lock people up in conditions like that, where they don't even have access to drinking water? So what I'm saying is that torture isn't just um, brutality, it's not just about physical torture, burning one's body or something. All of these uh, forms of deprivation are also forms of torture. Thank you very much. Mr. Staberok, there seems to be a real movement uh, today to go after war criminals. Uh, there are organizations in Geneva, for instance, uh, that uh, are uh, hunting for um, war criminals in Africa, in the Middle East. Uh, people who've committed war crimes are uh, hunted down many years later. Are we talking about um, hundreds of thousands of uh, interrogators here who have tortured people? Uh, and is there something similar? Do you have a list of names of people who've been accused of, uh, of uh, torture, who have maybe even led to a, a prisoner's death? And does your organization have such lists? Um, and uh, does it uh, try to bring these people to justice? Well, of course, torture is a crime. It's a violation of international law, not only during wartime, but during peace time as well. So any country that ratifies the Convention Against Torture, which is the main UN Convention Against Torture, um, has an obligation to criminalize torture um, with universal jurisdiction. So in principle, someone who is responsible for this type of torture, um, who comes to Europe, would risk arrest 
um, if information was available to prove that. And occasionally that has happened, but we're talking about a very small minority of people. The second thing I wanted to say was that some countries have not criminalized torture properly, including Switzerland, by the way. Uh, and next week, uh, there is a discussion on the criminalization of torture in the criminal code because we don't have a specific crime of torture uh, today in Switzerland. And a legal committee um, has been looking at the issue um, 35 years after the Convention Against Torture was ratified. And, you know, it's very useful to compare situations in other countries like Algeria um, in the context of uh, war crimes or crimes against humanity. But we shouldn't forget that we need to support women and men uh, fighting uh, for uh, human rights uh, and fighting against torture in these countries. And uh, what's very important when you see a film like this is uh, the need to support human rights defenders and give them a voice and protect them if possible because they can actually change the situation in the field. How many names of Iranian interrogators do you have on a list? We don't have a list like that, but it would be um, a good idea to try and identify the people responsible for this and see if any of them are traveling abroad. Uh, of course, fighting uh, for accountability when you have cases of torture sometimes takes years and years. And uh, our organization has, uh, submit, has, has lodged a complaint in Germany uh, about uh, torture in Belarus under universal jurisdiction. And it hasn't been effective immediately, but it will if someone is responsible for that and who goes to Germany, for example. Um, that's also something that's been done in Switzerland. It's not something we've done yet for people from Iran, but um, it would be a, a good idea. Mr. Ramani, do you know the names of the people who interrogated Narges? Well, you know, the interrogation process is entirely secret in Iran. Interrogators don't give you their name. In fact, they, they have uh, fake names. And you're standing there against the wall with a blindfold on, so you don't know who they are. That's the way it was in the 1980s. Uh, so you never knew people's real names. You know, they, they choose some uh, torture name, but uh, a name like uh, Brother or uh, Mr. Generous or something very cynical uh, and cruel. But it's not very easy to identify them properly. And of course, they have the state protection. And if you regularly go into prison, then you start to recognize them, but you don't actually know what their names are. You recognize their faces. And of course, if they went to Europe, they would come with a diplomatic passport. Um, they would be protected by the embassy. Maybe the intelligence services know who they are, but it's very difficult to identify them. Maybe later, one day, it might be possible, but honestly, when you're being interrogated, you're generally uh, blindfolded and, and staring at the wall. Well, one of the interrogators was identified and arrested with the help of Iranians in Europe. And he's currently facing trial. Hamid Nouri is his name in Sweden. He was called Habid Abbasi when he was working in prison and he was identified when he traveled to Sweden. There was a complaint uh, that had been lodged against him with the prosecutor and when he got to the airport in Stockholm he was arrested and he was um, charged and he's currently facing trial in Stockholm 
So that is a, a real victory for people in Iran. For the very first time, we've seen a torturer uh, facing trial in a European court. However, uh, we fear uh, that uh, political prisoner exchanges may take place, um, but uh, human rights uh, issues tend uh, to be neglected in favor of uh, political priorities, and uh, prisoner exchanges may take place where um, an inter interrogator is exchanged for somebody else. Um, so the government of Sweden could exchange that uh, interrogator for um, a citizen who has been arrested and detained in Iran. Those are the dirty tactics employed by the Iranian regime. What they do is they arrest um, dual nationals uh, or foreigners and detain them in Iranian prisons so that they can be used later uh, for political reasons, but for political motives. And I really hope that the court in Stockholm is actually uh, going to bring this person to justice. What was the role of this man in prison? Was he one of the lead interrogators? Was he uh, just one of the regular interrogators? Well, Mr. Nouri, um, back in the 1980s, uh, was an interrogator of prisoners and a torturer as well. I'd like to open up to the audience now. I imagine you may have questions. And uh, you have to wait for the microphone to come. Um, so that uh, the interpreters can hear your question. Are there any questions? At the back of the room, can we get a microphone to you? Good evening. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for um, these uh, comments. My question is, what really struck me in the film was that the people I felt had been affected most were those who'd only spent a few months in prison, whereas those who spent years in prison seemed to be dealing with it better. Were people released just after a few months because um, we thought they were already broken? Or, uh, I think one of the protagonists said, uh, at the end of the day, you get used to anything. Very good question. Well, yes, that's a very good question. People who manage to resist uh, have very strong beliefs. The Baha'i, for example, um, have faith that really helps them um, in these types of situations. And uh, I think most of the people in the film are friends or students that I knew very well. And actually, in recent years, democracy and human rights have become um, widely accepted principles. Most people want these things and they see that people living in European democracies um, want this and uh, Nagez uh, has been trying to reveal the situation regarding these, this solitary confinement and this white torture because the systems uh, of torture that have been used are, are evolving. 
بزرگی مدنی همین جوان ها هستن و میدونه این جوانی که نمیدونه پنج روز بدون They're doing this because they know that most people who are fighting oppression are young uh, and these young people can't live uh, for a week without their, their mobile phone uh, and so they know that this affects these young people very severely because um, as you know young people are always connected they have their mobile phones and this type of uh, torture is is, uh, is even more effective against uh, a young person like that and the regime the dictatorial regime is adapting its methods uh, and using current uh, cutting-edge techniques um, to reach their objectives. The Bacek prison, for example, where Nagas is being held today, um, bans three things, cucumbers, carrots, and bananas. It's humiliating for the people who were there, for the women in particular. This is how the regime operates, and it adapts its methods of torture to the types of prisoner that it's dealing with, so that their methods are as effective as possible. In my day, we resisted better this type of torture. But people used to flog us, they used to beat us. And those violent beatings that were used against us are not necessarily used uh, as much today. But solitary confinement can be used as a very effective tool against young people. I think you've seen that in the film. That's why it's so important to talk about the dangers of this type of torture. Merci. Il y a une autre question. Oui, madame, ici à gauche. Enfin... Merci. Merci de votre présence. Très Thank you. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'd like to put a question to Mr. Staberak and the World Organization Against Torture. We've got here in Switzerland people, uh, refugees who have been tortured, in particular in Iran, and who are being refused political asylum. Is there anything your organization can do? Well, of course, it depends on, on the particular cases. I cannot give you a general answer. But there's one thing I'd like to say clearly. There is one principle in international law of um, not returning people back to a country where they could be tortured again. And we have to fight for that as well. Nowadays, there are many refugees, and we're probably lacking a process to check whether people have been tortured or not, because these people would also require some kind of rehabilitation process. And there's a lot of work to be done. We're working here with partners in Switzerland to find solutions for people who have come here to Switzerland and have been tortured. We're trying to give them support and legal protection so that they're not evicted and um, sent back. Another question here? Merci beaucoup à vous deux pour votre Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being so brave and sharing your story. I'd like to know when you come out of prison, how in your own life, your own family, did you 
survive that? What are the mechanisms? Is there any help within the community? How do you survive such um, life experience? What began? Well, it depends, I must admit. Some families support their members, their family members in their political um, fight. And when these people are freed and get out of prison, their families are there to support them and help them. But in other families, this is not the case because they don't want to enter in political issues or maybe they're not really aware. If your question is to know whether there is some kind of organization to help for example, in rehabilitating torture victims, no, we, we don't have such an organization. However, we've got doctors, psychiatrists who are staunch believers in human rights and are able and willing to help for free. There are a few people like this. If somebody asks us, we can refer them to these people. There is no organization, nothing official, because it's not authorized by the government. Should there be such an organization, it would be dismantled and people would get detained. But there are doctors who help, unofficially at least. My name is Fakhboud Mahmoudi. I am Iranian. I was in prison for a year and seven months since 1999, starting in 1999 until 2000. Then I was detained again in 2009 until 2010. And solitary confinement in Iran is like dying every day. Dying every hour. And then you wake up again, you're being resuscitated by a bucket full of cold water, for example. You're alive, but you're feeling dead, completely dead. You don't feel anything. You're not able to breathe. You're not able to sleep. If you happen to fall asleep, you will have nightmares. Otherwise, it means you wouldn't have been in prison. I've been living in Switzerland for two years and a half. It took me four years to get here. But each time, each time security agents appeared when I was in a camp, for example, I thought they were prison wardens. I've got recounts from psychologists who say that I couldn't even believe I was in Switzerland. I couldn't understand where I was. 
You cannot get this out of your head, out of your body, out of your mind. It is impossible to forget um, um, the isolation we lived through during COVID. How could you forget isolation and solitary confinement? Merci, Monsieur. Je, just a question. You said you have nothing to say, but. Uh, just a question, because you, um, you say you have nothing more to say, but how do you feel after seeing the movie? I've known Mrs. Mohammadi for years. I've known her since I was in Iran and she got detained. I know Mr. Panahi as well. I was a journalist. I've worked for 19 years in Iran. But all of this work has disappeared in no time at all. In the movie, there's, there's a lot of suffering, but it's only one small part of what we go through. You cannot even imagine how men are being raped. They will make you sit on hot chairs and burn your feet. And they will do anything they can so that your wounds get infected. Some people have been through horrible things in prison. I believe that this movie, this film, should be analyzed and discussed at length. I work with a psychiatrist in Geneva who is specialized in people who have been through a war, a conflict. I took part in a war when I was 14. I, I didn't understand anything about war. At the time, I thought I would go to paradise. I would end up in paradise. When I got um, hurt, then I understood war. Then I became a journalist. I've been to Syria, to Afghanistan. I spent 11 years in Iraq. But compared to all of these horrors, the seven months I spent in prison were even worse. I was in Iraq when Isla the Islamic State took over some of the regions. But I swear, the seven months I spent in prison were far worse. My son keeps asking me why, what number seven means to me. That's because my name was number 17. So I always have number 17 in my phone number, for example. I cannot forget number 17. Il y avait une question, je crois, ici. Madame, au quatrième rang à gauche. Merci pour ces euh, témoignages poignants. Thank you very much uh, for these uh, very moving uh, testimonies. Nardish, uh, Narg Nargis has been very brave, uh, but she's paid the price for it and she's back in prison. I'd like to know what happened to the other people in the film. Have they too um, undergone reprisals by the intelligence because most of them, I believe, are still living in Iran. Those people you see in the film, well, most of them 
are under a lot of pressure. Most of them are not working. They're unemployed. Some of them are journalists and have begun um, workers. One of the people you see was a student leader in Iran. But nowadays, he's unemployed. He can do. He cannot do anything. Madame Ravomi has left the country. Madame Hedayat. Has been sentenced to seven years in prison because she took part in a protest related to the Ukrainian uh, flight that was uh, shot down. As to Madame Armani, she was told she wasn't allowed to speak about her son on the social media. Mr. Baudori, who was one of the activists, has got a new, another case against him. Some people are still willing to continue to fight, but a lot, many of them do not have the courage any longer. That's why, precisely why Nargis wants to insist on that and raise awareness against this inhuman practice. Well, you yourself have very strong words. Somebody maybe from the Iranian embassy is here in the room or listening or watching you. Are you not afraid uh, for yourself when you uh, go back to Tehran at some point? No, I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm a political refugee in France. I am afraid for those who remain in Iran. Of course, the Iranian government has some time done things to people abroad, but I feel very small myself compared to those who resist and remain in a country. So the least I can do is to talk about this movie, to explain that there is no freedom in Iran, and to explain that we have the right to have a democracy in Iran. There are thousands of people in Iran facing so many problems. In Iran, every 10 years, since the creation of the Islamic Republic, there have been social protests. There is a real, a real quest for freedom. In the Middle East region, this is quite rare protests by retirees, by teachers. Those are not very political um, protests or demands, but currently more than 100 teachers have been accused can you imagine that a teacher because he's taken part in a protest can be condemned to 10 years imprisonment but still people go out in the streets so the least I can do it to is to tell those stories dans le même ordre d'idée madame well, similarly, um, Ms. Ibadi, you haven't been back to Iran uh, since 2008, 2009, and your um, husband uh, can't get out of Iran. So is this a ban on travel, uh, um, another form of torture for you and for him? Pale, dar sale well, in 2009, when they came to my office, my home, 
and they broke in. I was uh, actually in Spain. I'd been, I traveled to Spain for three days when it happened. And my colleagues told me that I shouldn't go back to Iran. I should uh, go to the UN. And uh, seek uh, support. And I realized that if I went back to Iran, I would be imprisoned and I couldn't be useful. But if I stayed abroad and I spoke out uh, on behalf of the Iranian people, I could be much more useful. So I didn't go back to Iran. I just had a small bag, a small bag with my things for three days. But since I wasn't in Iran, they arrested my sister. Um, to try and silence me. They arrested my husband because they couldn't arrest me. He spent years in prison. They um, seized all of my possessions. They um, froze my bank accounts, the house that I'd inherited from my father. They seized and they sold it so that I could never go back there, even um, if uh, the regime changed. And they sent me a message. They said, if you um, stop talking, uh, then you can come back to Iran. And I said, never. You won't, you won't be able to silence me. Uh, my sister was then uh, released, and uh, my husband too, but uh, for many years they weren't allowed to leave the country. Until at some point there was such international support for their cause. And the regime realized that they weren't getting anywhere and trying to silence me. And they removed that uh, ban, uh, that travel ban, on my on the, my family members, and I've seen them uh, once or, or twice. I think there's another person asking a question. Um, the same person who asked a question earlier, actually. Merci. Uh, Thank you. Anyone seeing your film here? Um, may think, well, how can we help you? Um, how exactly can we help? Well, probably the best thing that you could do would be to talk about this, uh, to... Um, talk about uh, what you've seen and show this film as often as possible uh, and really talk about what's going on in Iran um, to other people. And, and since you live in Europe, uh, in democracies, when it comes to voting for your elected representatives, uh, when it comes to voting for your president or your political parties, then choose people who are committed to promoting human rights and protecting human rights. And if you make the right choice and choose the right people to represent you, um, then it really helps human rights defenders um, in the work that we do. You know, it's very sad to have to say that um, there are many governments um, uh, who are not democratic, and we see a regression uh, of democracy around the world. You see right-wing governments who only pursue economic objectives, uh, and trade agreements. And they don't seem to care 
about um, people being killed or tortured or human rights. So you, um, European civil society, um, can do a great deal to help us. So my plea would be um, help us as much as you can. There's a question at the front here, at the right. سلام خیلی ممنون برای بابتتون که اومدید اینجا اینا رو گفتید به ما من یه سوال دارم فقط چرا Thank you very much thank you very much for coming and uh, for being here with us Why did they release your husband Was that a tactic on their part uh, what were they trying to achieve by releasing your husband uh, at the end of the day It's not the first time I've heard about uh, this type of thing happening. Is this a tactic that they employ by releasing people in this way? Well, in 2009, when millions of Iranians took to the streets to demonstrate. Because they believed that there had been a re- electoral fraud. The regime tried to silence civil society. And at that time, now I guess uh, myself and a few others established the largest uh, uh, pioneering um, Iranian human rights organization, the Defenders of Human Rights Center. And Nages is the spokesperson now, and I'm the president. And our offices were... Uh, looted on several occasions uh, with the Nobel Prize I bought a par- an apartment for the establishing the office for the association and we uh, did uh, achieve a great deal um, in, in the work that we did and when the government decided to silence Iranian civil society, they decided to um, close down our uh, organization, close down our office, and uh, seize uh, my house, the office, uh, Mr. Abdel Fazl Sultani, the lawyer who you saw in the film, was, was imprisoned. Uh, for nine years, another lawyer, a uh, six-year prison sentence, Nagas, eight years. And other people who used to work for us were arrested. I think there were about 20 lawyers working with us, and uh, each of them were arrested and put in prison including Nesun Sutu there, who was another colleague of ours, who ended up in prison as well. So they really shut down our activities um, and our human rights work. That's why I decided to stay abroad, where I could be more effective. Um, because they were so effective in shutting down organizations in Iran. Um, All kinds of uh, associations, uh, filmmakers, uh, social associations, they they were shut down. Uh, We weren't particularly political. We didn't have any political ambitions. We didn't want to take power. They just shut us down. And so since 2009, unfortunately, um, Iran is going from bad to worse. Um, 
the regime is getting more and more violent, and uh, it's, it's, it's not going in the right direction. Are there any further questions? Yes, the gentleman here at the front. I've been told that I can continue as long as there are questions, so I'm going on with the debate. Do you stop me if uh, this is going on for too long? I just wondered if you had any news from uh, Narges. Uh, are, you, are you in touch with her? Can you get news from her? ببینید وقتی که الان یه زندانی در انفرادیه به راحتی نمیتواند با خانواده تماس بگیره. A prisoner in solitary confinement uh, is not allowed to contact their family but تماس بگیرد با تلفن و ملاقات داشته باشه. ولی در sometimes they uh, in normal prisons they can get contact with their families but in her prison it's very difficult to uh, contact her. Um, Nagas's family are in Azanjan, uh, 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 and they can visit, but only very rarely. So we do get some news, and what's more important isn't the phone, and to be able to phone her, but um, what's really terrible is that the conditions are so difficult for her in prison, as I shared a few details with you. Um, they're very effective in uh, making life extremely difficult for their prisoners. And there's a lot of anxiety. The, the security apparatus in uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran is extremely effective. They're not um, um, like the Taliban. Uh, Iranian society uh, is a very uh, urban society. And young people in Iran uh, all have telephones, they have access to the internet. They know uh, artists and singers from all over the world. They know exactly what's uh, coming out you know, in American cinemas. You can see the films that come out in the US uh, a week later in Iran. So we're living in a globalized society. These young people are connected to the world, and so the regime is under pressure. And as you saw, it was very difficult to live through lockdown in Europe. And those young people who are fighting the regime today are those who are facing uh, repression, and they also uh, have economic challenges. They are desperate for the types of rights that you enjoy in Europe. And it's very frustrating for them because they're not getting those rights. Since the nuclear agreements and the suspension of the nuclear agreement, there's a lot of economic pressure uh, being put on people now. And people do um, pay, attach considerable importance to a good standard of living. They want that good standard of living, but the government wants to try to impose uh, one way of life, uh, headscarf, uh, the, uh, the social constraints that are imposed by the government. Uh, Young people uh, want something different. They want to enjoy the uh, standard of living, way of life that they see people enjoying in other countries. Seventy percent of Iranians live in cities. There are five million students at university, and many of those are women. But the government does try to stop women getting access to certain types of uh, university studies, and this is even more frustrating for them. Young women and men want to be able to choose their own destinies. So we've heard uh, about uh, what people in Iranian society want, but I just think one last point is that we need to be slightly optimistic and 
but one of the people, one of the gods, seems to be quite humane. Um, he tells him that no, they weren't his children um, that he heard or that he thought he heard. Maybe it was a recording or something. It wasn't his children who'd been brought into the prison. In your experience as prisoners, did you also see any signs of humanity in the prison guards that you met there? Man, Pale. Yes. Yes, I did. When I was in prison the first time, it was 11 o'clock at night when I was arrested and put in solitary confinement, like all prisoners when they first arrive. And dinner had already been served. Dinner is served at around about 7 p.m. The interrogator shoved me into the room and then a, a female guard opened the door and gave me some bread and cheese on a small plate and said, look, I'm so sorry for you, Miss Abadi. I know you're hungry. I know you haven't had dinner. You've been um, in, in detention since this morning. And this is all I had, but I wanted to bring you something because I realized that you were probably hungry. And I was so surprised. I never expected to see that type of uh, attitude on the part of a, a prison guard. Uh, and so I said, do you know me? Because you've called me Miss Abadi, you must know me. And she said, look at me, don't you remember? Don't you remember me? And I said, no, uh, I don't remember. How do we, need, do we know each other? And she said, I was in the juvenile prison years ago. Seven or, eight, seven or eight years ago, actually. I created an, ON, uh, I created an NGO for the protection of children's rights, and I was the president of that uh, NGO for many years. And one of our programs was to go into the juvenile prison and organize training programs and social welfare programs. And this lady said that she'd been a guard in that prison and uh, that she'd seen how well we worked to try and protect uh, those children who were detained there. And she said to me, I'm so sorry to see you here. That that's why I wanted to bring you this food. And I'm sorry to have to be your prison guard on this occasion. And if you need anything, when I'm on watch, just tell me, because, of course, they change shifts every 24 hours. And I said, thank you so much. I don't need anything. She said, do you want a cigarette? And I said, no, I don't smoke. And then she left. And when she left, I broke down in tears because I'd seen humanity. Since that morning, I'd been in interrogation and uh, I'd been shouting, I'd been as strong as I could. But recognizing that humanity in a prison guard um, made me cry. And she said, I, I remember how you looked after those poor children in prison. And um, that's why years later, she tried to help me. And then the next week, they put me in a different prison, and I never saw that woman again. But then years later, eight years later, also, I was in a seminar in Iran, and I saw her again. And I said, how are you? What are you doing now? 
What are you up to? And she said, uh, thankfully, I've retired. And I'm no longer um, doing that uh, awful um, job that I used to do. So it's amazing to see that type of humanity in a prison guard. Even prison guards um, can show that type of humanity. Not all prison guards are torturers, uh, even in dictatorships like Iran. Most people work in the, pub in the public sector in Iran. That's where most jobs are. So you have to work with the system. But it doesn't mean that everyone is necessarily evil. This lady really taught me something. You shouldn't judge everybody um, by their uniform or the job that they do. Well, I think that's a, an excellent way to close this uh, evening's uh, debate. It's a note of hope. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for telling us about your experiences uh, and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you.